Okay, Jeff Pilson is my guest today. Jeff is, of course, the current bass player for Foreigner, former bass player for Dokken, and is also involved with a ton of projects as a producer and a musician. Uh, his, some of his most recent musician projects include The End Machine, Black Swan, and Revolution Saints. So we're going to talk a lot about his amazing career highlights, his thoughts on the current state of rock, his future plans, and so much more. Stay right there. We'll go ahead and just dive right in. Um, actually, it's funny because I just had a guy. Uh, I don't, do you remember Chris Von Dahl? He was in a band sure. called Terry Street. Of yeah, not. he's a good friend of mine. I oh, just, okay. When we did, we didn't see him this year in Vegas, but I saw him last year when we did our residency in Vegas. Yeah, he and his wife are good friends of ours, and we love them dearly. Yeah, it's just funny because I had him on the show, and he he brought you up. He was talking about Slash, and he goes, "Yeah, we were at Jeff Pilson's house," and I was like wait, like Jeff and Slash were friends. He's like, oh yeah, everybody was friends with, with Jeff back in the day. So I didn't know that. I don't know if Slash wrote about you in his book, but tell me about your friendship with Slash. That just intrigues me a little bit. Ah, uh, okay. Well, um, I mean, I, I met Slash, you know, even bef- right as they were coming out. Um, you know, before they were big and famous, I, I remember having some, you know, we would drink and talk at the Rainbow. Not a lot. I mean, we, we weren't close at that point at all. Um, but you know, there was a little bit of that. Then as they got famous, Steven Adler is one of my best friends and is to this day, one of my best friends. So, um, towards the end of Steven's tenure, so 89, 90 around in there, um, I started, uh, hanging with Slash a bit more, you know, I mean, at first it was kind of a drinking thing. Then I actually got sober. Um, but, uh, we, we kind of maintained a friendship. Then at one point he was, uh, he was hanging at my house quite a bit. Um, and that's for kind of, there was stuff going on, but that, you don't have to know about all that, but, um, <laughs> oh, that <laughs> sounds like the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, no, so but, wait, but he's, there's stuff going on, but this is when you're sober. So are you kind of like the babysitter at this point? No, not, no, just, just hanging. We were just hanging, you know, I mean, um, do you jam? Do you play any music together? You know what? We really didn't. And I wish we would have, because I, I mean, yeah. we talked about it, but we just never really did. <laughs> um, but I have jammed with Slash, of course, over the years. Yeah. Um, and I just, you know, I've maintained a friendship with him. I mean, it's not a close friendship by any means. Um, but, you know, um, we talk about Steve, you know, we we keep in touch about Steven a lot. You know, he, he wants to make sure Steven's doing good, which he is. Um, and um, he knows that Steven and I are real close. So um, there's that. And then, you know, then it's just fun stuff. Like I got our tour bus last year in Europe. I walk out of the tour bus and there's a doll, a slash doll with guitar, you know, a top hat and cigarette and everything. And so I had to take a picture of that and send it to him. And I said, are you stalking me? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. And like he played on uh, Steven's, uh, one of Steve, Steven's uh, solo records, the one that was just called Adler that, Right. You produced, he, he right? Did that, he did that right here. So, oh, okay. So, yeah, is that your studio? That's uh, what do you call it? Pill Sound Studios? Pill Sound, yes, that you are seeing. Yeah. Explain to me that because I'm thinking about doing a home studio. I mean, for podcasting, but I'm assuming it would be kind of similar. Do you have any advice for building a home studio? Well, you're going to want to make sure that it, the sound is decent. So, you notice I have, see all those baffles and everything that I have? Yeah. So, Lots of sound reinforcement. Does that really make a big difference? Uh, well, I mean, probably more for music than it does for okay. uh, podcasting stuff. But, you know, it, it helps when you're listening that it's a controlled environment. You don't want to have too much bass that, you know, shoots up that then when you take it to another system, it sounds bass shy and all that kind of thing. Well, and especially I would think drums would be the because t- that's so loud. It could echo and then. Right. Well, uh, yeah, although um, the drums are in an echoey room. Uh, the the mm-hmm. room that I have for the drums, ha- there I purposely have it different surfaces. So there's stone right in back of the drums, which give it a nice reflection. There's mm-hmm. wood on the floor and on the walls, and then there's fabric. So with all three of those surfaces i get a nice reflection on the drums which you actually want because you want the drums to sound big and like they're you know resonating um but then in here when i'm listening to everything i want it controlled so that i'm not hearing random frequencies that aren't really there gotcha 
How did, so how did you learn all this pr production stuff? Cause obviously you produce in, in addition to playing bass, is it just through all the recording you've done? I mean, yeah. Yeah, sure. I just mean, experience, I, just trial and error. And yeah. And I mean, like ever since I was a kid, I've loved, I've loved the whole recording process. Um, and I'm fascinated by it. So, um, I mean, I was the kid that had, you know, the, I had a reel to reel tape recorder. I'd record on that, you know, I'd maybe play guitar and sing. And then I'd, have my cassette machine and play back the reel to reel and record the cassette and sing harmonies along and, you know, that kind of thing. I was one of those guys doing that at 16 years old. So I've always loved the process um, and always had a real curiosity about it. And I've been fortunate enough to work with some amazing people. I mean, the, the Jeff Workman's, the Tom Worman's, the Michael Wagner's, the Wynn Davis's, the Neil Kernan's, you know, I mean, I've worked the Keith Olson's. I mean, the list goes on of the incredible producers, engineers that I've worked with. So I've tried to learn as much by osmosis as I can. And um, and I love it. You know, when you when you love something, you know, you do it well. Yeah. So just learning from all those, God, that's amazing. Yeah, all the people that you worked with. Tell me about um, I was so curious because I one of the first things I noticed when I started researching you was that. Uh, you're from Washington, kind of like you grew up in Longview, Washington. I know where that is. I'm from Seattle. I actually okay. applied for a job in Camas, which is like, I don't know, 40 minutes from there or something. Yeah. I think it's Camas, Washington. It's like South, yeah. a little further. Yep. Yep. And then there's Astoria, Oregon is kind of like a little, yes. it's also around there, which is like where the Goonies and all these movies were filmed. But right. yeah, talk about growing up in Longview. I mean, that was when you were what, like 13, 16, you moved there or something? I moved there when I was 13. Yeah. Um, well, you know, the thing is I had never been, I, you know, I was coming from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I lived in a really nice suburb of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. That was the sixth rated school district in the country. So, uh, very, wow. and, and I, I had friends there that are still friends to this day, but I moved back west, moved west and I go into this school system that was actually a year behind. So my seventh, uh, or I'm sorry, my eighth grade year was an academic repeat of my seventh grade year in Wisconsin. So I, it was, you know, that, that I think started me on a path of, you know, I wanted to, I just wanted to play music. I was in this small town. I felt, you know, out of place and, you know, all the, the estranged feelings you feel as a kid when you're somewhere new. Um, so music became my, my outlet and my, um, my save salvation really. Um, so every day I would come home and just play along with records. And that was my, that was my school. So playing by yourself mostly then. Yeah. I mean, at, at the first couple of years, sure. You know, you you learn to play along with records. And then I started jamming with people probably about the time I was 14, I want to say. And um, yeah, it's been pretty hard and heavy. Well, actually at 13, when I did move to Washington, I met some friends fairly soon. We didn't have a drummer, but you know, we played guitars and I had my bass. And so there was, there was the, um, that early momentum of, of playing. Um, but yeah, between playing along with records and playing with other musicians who are also developing, that's a great way to learn. Yeah. And then didn't you also like you were, you worked at a, a music store and then you, you it tell me this be, thing. Yeah. yeah. Tell the, tell my audience the story about how you, you convinced your high school to, to give you like a, a waiver or something and that you could work on music. And <laughs> that was awesome. Yeah, well, well, okay. So, so I, starting when I was 15, so I think I was a sophomore. Um, I started managing this music store because it's called Bob and Corky's musical emporium and guitar shop uh, in Longview, Washington. And Corky, the owner of the shop, he, 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 we just had this great relationship. He was, you know, he was probably in his thirties. I want to guess. So he seemed old, um, but, <laughs> um, but he trusted me. And he taught me how to manage the music store because then I could be there while he's at work because he worked in the factory in Longview. So um, it was great. I mean, I, I, I loved working there. Um, but because of that, in my senior year, yes, I got this waiver. I got my school to accept this waiver program where one period a day might have even been two periods, but it was at least one. All I had to do for the whole quarter was write one song, which of course <laughs> I could do in a day. So, um, <laughs> so, so I would use that time to either jam at the music store or I'd go up in the, in the music room at the, at the school and, you know, play and write something, whatever. Um, but yeah, I, I, my senior year was, um, was a gift. 
Yeah, that's cool. So, and then I know you went to University of Washington. I'm not sure how long you stayed there, but tell me about your thoughts on uh, music and education, because I just had uh, the singer of a, a up and coming band called Dead Poets Society, and he went to the Berkeley School of Music, which I think is one of the most prestigious yeah. music schools. And he says, basically, it's a waste of time other than networking with other musicians. But mm -hmm. you learn a lot of the other stuff just by playing in bands and things like that. Do you agree? I do. Um, and honestly, um, my time at the University of Washington music program, uh, I had a wonderful bass teacher, string bass teacher. Uh, he was the first ch uh, first chair string bassist with the Seattle Symphony. Great, great, great player and teacher. And that was that was great. Um, but the classes were very old school, traditional classical. Um, so, I, they, you know, I mean, I'm glad I know music theory and all that kind of stuff. But but really, yeah, it's 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 out there getting out there playing. And that's that's the nitty gritty. Were you playing in bands in Seattle during that time? Like, were oh, you yeah. playing the Seattle scene with was Queens right around there? No, around that time? Not, no. Yet. not yet, because this is seven, mid 70s, mind you. So, oh, OK, oh, uh, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, there was there wasn't a huge scene in Seattle, which is why I ended up leaving at the time. What, but I was involved in the Prague community because I was a total Prague guy back then. You know, yeah, I mean, Chris Squire was my guy. So yes, Genesis, ELP, General Giant, that was that was my stuff. Um, and we had a little bit of a scene in Seattle that had that. I was in a band called Christmas. Um, but then it kind of faded out because at the end of the 70s, all that stuff just, you know, it 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 got uh, died a horrible death. And um so that's when I kind of shifted over going more towards hard rock. Yeah. And then you moved to San Francisco and became mm -hmm. friends with Mike Varney. What made you choose San Francisco as opposed to LA or New York or. Well, because my, after the, the week after my senior year of high school, my best friend and I, we, we huddled, we, we got ourselves down to Northern California. I don't, and I still don't know how we did this, but we, we flew down there and somehow I don't even remember how we did it, but we had no money, but we moved down there because we had joined this band. I On my spring break, I had joined a band that was in the Bay Area. So I'd have something to do when I got out of school. So I came down there, I showed up with no money, nowhere to live, and a guy with me that he, he didn't even know. <laughs> but he put up, but he put up with it. And so I had a band that I joined when I when I went down there. Well, of course, that lasted for the summer. Um, but in that summer, uh, I met a lot of really interesting people, including Mike Varney. So um, when I went back to Seattle in the fall to go to school, um, that's when, uh, uh, you know, that whole Seattle experience happened. When that fell apart, then I decided, well, the next logical place is the other one I know, which is San Francisco. And I knew Mike Varney. And so when I got down there, and very soon after I got down there, the the Rock Justice Project happened that Mike was involved in with Marty Ballon from the Starship, and so that they kind of drew me into that, and so there was a, there was a lot of good stuff that started happening. Okay, and then that's also where you met. Did you meet Paul Taylor in San Francisco as well? I did. Yeah, and then absolutely. you ended up rooming with him. So all these connections, yep. it seems like a lot of networking for you. Is that a big part of your success? Do you feel like? Yeah, but by happenstance, you know, I, I, I've never been like Mr. Schmoozy networking guy, but um, but by happenstance, yes, I am. <laughs> yeah, because it's interesting, like with Foreigner, um, you know, you and Kelly Hansen are both in that, which is I think is so cool. But, you know, you're you're not the guy from Dawkins. Kelly Hansen is not the singer from Hurricane. Now you keep you guys keep evolving. What how do you what is the secret to that? Like guys like you and Kelly, how do you continually reinvent yourselves so you're not just this one band thing that, that you know, that happened. Well, you know, it's funny. I don't feel like I necessarily do any reinventing at all. I just feel like I do my, my thing. <laughs> and, and by staying involved and active and passionate and committed, I think you, you naturally change because that's what the circumstances call for. So yeah, re really, it's not like an attempt to always want to evolve. It's just an attempt to always do my best and give my best. And it, it must be working because you just keep getting work. And so obviously we got to talk about the new project revolution saints, which um, you say, I just played bass on it, but obviously being just even referred to, to have that, that's a good gig. I mean, you're working oh, with wonderful. great people. Are you kidding? And I love, I love it. And I love the fact that I just have to play bass on it. Cause I, I produce other records. So this is kind of fun to just be the bass player. 
And I have infinite faith in Alessandro, who is the producer writer for Revolution Saints. Uh, we have a tremendous working real arrangement. So, um, so yeah, for me, it's a treat and I love it. And, you know, Dean's voice, I mean, just to sit and listen to Dean's voice to me is enough. <laughs> yeah. Explain to people, like, would you, how do you describe this music? To, Cause to me, I mean, obviously Dean's the drummer from Journey. It sounds, there's very, there's vibes of Journey. I mean, maybe it's a little journey, bit heavier. It's a heavier Journey. That's exactly, if I were to describe it, I would describe it as a heavier Journey. It's as if Journey wanted to really be a mainstream rock band again. Okay. And so on this one, you just play bass, but maybe on the next one, would you maybe sing, uh, co-write, maybe co-produce or? Well, um, there was actually two records written in the can when I joined. So I played on the first one, which is the one coming out today it's today oh. no tomorrow 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 oh. anyway um it's out and, for me now because i get the advanced coffee <laughs> okay right um and then um and then there's already another record that we've all played on that's in the oh. can okay now, later on this summer we are going to start writing for the third one which i'm sure won't come out till well into 2025 um but uh we're going to start writing that over the summer so that'll be very exciting there's already a couple songs that i've thrown in that that we're going to work on so it's going to be fun it's going to be really fun so you said like you liked that you could just play bass so talk about like uh the different uh jobs you do in music producing playing bass songwriting but also singing you were in this band war and peace where you were the front man um did you like that was there advantages to that i mean that must be nice like you're kind of in charge and you have a great singing voice i thought well thank you um i yeah i love fronting but i i don't I just don't feel honestly that my voice is special enough to really warrant a band around it and go to play. I do have a lot of material that I work on. It's very different than a lot of the stuff that I release with other bands. Someday I'll probably put out some kind of a solo record just to make that artistic statement. Uh, and I'll sing on that and I'll do, a, I'll do most of the instruments on that. Um, but as far as fronting, I don't, I, I rather I get more of a thrill of listening to better singers, to be perfectly honest with you. So I would rather be in a situation with better singers. Um, and when I'm producing, I feel as a singer, I I make for a good vocal producer. <laughs> um, but I would rather do that than um than than just sing myself. I really would. Do you prefer um playing on stage and playing bass? And, and like in Foreigner, you're playing the same songs, or is it more of a thrill to create new music, or is it both, just different? Well, it's both, but different. I mean, yes, because um, I'm on year 20 with Foreigner. You know, yeah, there's a little bit of like, the grass is always greener. So whenever I see a recording studio, which is whenever I come home, um, I'm in it because I love it. And I love to record. I love the recording process. I will do this as much as I can until Foreigner ends. And then when Foreigner ends, I'll probably do it even more. So, um, but I, I wonder, well, will I get to a point in a couple of years where I'll miss playing live? I don't know. But for now, you're going to continue to tour. I mean, well, if Foreigner ends, you'd, you could tour with what? One of these other, The End well, Machine yeah. or Black and Swan? Maybe that could happen. And yeah, I mean, Foreigner is going to tour till the end of 2024 for sure. Okay. Um, but yes, maybe that does open up that Revolution Saints or M Machine or Black Swan could go out there and play at some point. That would be great. I I never like to, you know, make a commitment about that to the public because it's so tricky getting guys in all these bands together to play live and it's expensive and it's hard to pull off and the list goes on. But um, if it could ever happen, I would love it. And yeah, maybe that's something that could happen more once the four years are behind us. Yeah. Could you do something like a package, either a package tour of like end machine, black Swan revolution saints, or I'll have all three play the same festival. Cause I know that's a big thing. Festivals or monsters or rock crews or those kinds of things. Wow. You, you really want me to work hard, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking logistically, isn't that yeah. what you guys kind of have to do nowadays well, for? Yeah. I mean, that would, that, that's the kind of thing I could see happening. Yeah. Um, I, I honestly don't know. And you know, anything is open and fine for me, but uh, yeah, just, it's just so hard to, uh, it's hard to make it a reality. It just is. Okay. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Dokken. I'm sure there's a lot of Dokken fans out there who want me to ask Dokken questions. I'm trying to think of things that uh, you haven't been asked about Dokken. Um, 
Tell me, explain to me uh, how I'm not in a band. I'm not in the music business other than interviewing musicians, but in terms of like, if you're a founding member, how does that work? Cause I know the whole thing with Motley Crue, like Mick Mars is, he's not, he's being cut out or something. How does that work? Like with you and doc and you're not in the band currently, do you no. still get a cut of uh, obviously the music you've played on, but what about like merch or things like that? Is that something? No, that no, no. There, there was a severing of the uh, partnership with, okay. with me and doc and, in, I want to say 2003. So no, I mean, every, everything, anything Don does as doc and now that's him. Um, but yeah, you know, we, we, we get does he have to buy you out or I don't understand there how those, was, there was, yeah, there was a, yeah. there was okay. a legal proceeding to make it happen. Yes. Yeah. And it's interesting. Like you guys had a lawsuit with George Lynch and then, but then you like, you got over it and that's kind of interesting to me. <laughs> Cause it's a lawsuit. Um, yeah. Well, I like, think like, there's no grudges. Like he just called you up one day and it's like, Hey buddy, what's going on? You're like, you guys do not talk about that. Or do you just kind of talk just... about it? Sure. Yeah. Of course. Of course. But I mean, I mean, basically the lawsuit happened in 97 or eight, I want to say. Um, and you know, then he and I started working together in 2001 and that's a couple years later. And when he called me up, it was kind of like, yeah, okay, we're over it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, it, it, you know, it, it, it's just the crap of being in a band. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because I, I used to be a counselor in, in schools and, uh, you know, they'd always have me do the mediations. And uh, if you bring, you know, two guys in, they could literally get in a fist fight and I could talk to them. They work it out. The next day, they're best friends again. Now, girls, a lot of times, not to be sexist, but a lot of times girls will hold on to the grudge a lot longer. So that's how I kind of thought about that when I heard that story about you. I was like, oh, he. This is guys. This is what guys, we just get over shit. So do you think Mick Mars and Molly Crew, whatever, they'll probably kiss and make up in a few years? Uh, I don't know the specifics of their deal. I mean, yeah, it, it sound. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't want to comment on their deal because I just don't know it, but I hope they do. Um, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're good guys. You know, they, sh they should. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's, it's hard to see that kind of stuff as a fan. Everyone's taking sides and it's like, I'm not taking a side because I don't, I don't know what's going on. I'd like to hear more. I'd like to have them on my show and, and figure it out. But uh, it's hopefully it's one of those things that can blow over in a little bit. It's, well, it's what hard. I will tell you is I, I got to admit, I've heard some snippets of Mick Mars solo record and it's oh, really yeah. incredible. I hope to God he puts it out because it's really, really strong. And by the way, Paul Taylor is working on it. So that, yeah, he that, told me about that. He, he yeah. finished it and up. It, or so. it is really, really good. I hope, hope this inspires Mick to release it because it's really good. And Mick deserves to be heard. He's got some really good music on there. Who else is on that? Uh, who's the, cause I thought John Karabi was singing at one point and then he got replaced no, or. I don't believe so. I think Jacob's, I mean, what I heard Jacob was singing, I think. There was oh, Jacob Button, right? Yeah. 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 I think Jacob was singing everything that I heard. Are you on it? No, no. Oh, you didn't produce it or anything. You just got to listen. I, I, yeah, I mean, Paul, I'm surprised he did not ask you to do a song or something or backup vocals or something. Well, I mean, that was done in Nash. A lot of it was done in Nashville and, and mixed stuff was, I mean, yeah. I mean, they don't, they didn't need me. <laughs> they have plenty. <laughs> Where are you located? I'm in LA, North of LA a little bit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you like that scene or is it, do you think you'll retire somewhere else at some point? Well, It'd be hard to replace this studio because I got a beautiful studio and I got a beautiful drum room out there and I got, you know, beautiful isolation room for my amps there. So that would be difficult to uh, to replace. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I love it here. I love where we are. Um, I love our house. I love my studio. So, I mean, I hope I can stay here a long time, but we'll see. Yeah. It, it doesn't excite you to build a new one and upgrade it. And um. Yeah, if the, if the opportunity arose, I mean, I'm kind of comfortable now, but. <laughs> yeah, no, it looks cool. Very cool. Um, so, yeah, with Doc and I mean, it's so interesting. I, I was looking back. I was like, I didn't realize you guys, you've toured with almost every major band, Aerosmith, ACDC, Metallica, Van Halen. And uh, now, of course, you're in foreign. I mean, is there any band that you have not toured with that you that's on your bucket list? That's like, I mean, unless it's like a band like Led Zeppelin, that's obviously not together anymore. Oh, the foreigner did play a gig with Led Zeppelin. <laughs> when you were the. We played the oh, we played the uh, at the oh seven oh two arena show for the Ahmed Erdogan tribute. We played right before Zeppelin. 
You remember that big show that they had in 2007? No, was that it that wasn't was under the Led Zeppelin Day, uh what you call it uh DVD. Okay. Was that is that was that like Page Plant or was it actually it wasn't under the Led Zeppelin it, name? Yeah, it was called Led Zeppelin in 2007. Really? Yeah, and it was it was John Paul Jones, Robert Plant, Jimmy Page and Jason Bonham. Um so yeah, and they they played as Led Zeppelin. It was a huge show. Broke the internet because the 20 million requests for tickets for the 20,000 seats in the O2 arena. It was, it was crazy. Um, but anyways, yeah, Foreigner played right before Zeppelin at that show, which was very cool. Well, there you go. That's amazing. God, geez, everything. It's just Paul McCartney is the only one that you haven't worked with yet. I've never worked with Paul McCartney or Ringo, and I haven't worked with Ringo. Met Ringo, rocked out with Paul, didn't actually meet him. But at rocked that 07. I thought it was something. <laughs> it's kind of funny. So it was at the 07 uh, Ahmed Erdogan show during Led Zeppelin's set. And there was an area, you know, for the VIPs up top. So after the show, my wife and I went to the area, to the VIP area, and we're just kind of walking. And and um, and and the song Rock and Roll starts, right? Um, the Zeppelin rock and roll song. And so we're walking along and, and my wife and I want to find there's this little area that we where you can kind of see in the VIP area. So we start walking along, and all of a sudden my wife is like doing this to me. I'm like, what? She goes, and I look over and it's Paul McCartney. And he's he's walking alongside us, right? And we get to the area where everybody's standing, although it was only a couple people at this point. It was just Paul, my wife, and I standing in this area, and he's he's rocking out totally like a fan it's like you can tell he's away from anybody seeing him and he's like Bad along. you know he's totally being a fan and you know my wife and i are looking at him and we're kind of doing the same and he's looking at us like yeah you know? and you know i didn't say anything or anything but i got to rock out with paul sir paul <laughs> oh that's fucking awesome very cool that's very cool. What is it like being on the other end of that? Because you've been on the other end of that where people are starstruck to meet you and rock out with you and get pictures and all that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, what's it like to be on that end? I, you know, it's a, it's a sort, sort of a closure thing. You know, it's like, wow, I'm getting to meet my heroes and hopefully I'll. I mean, honestly, it was a meeting with Chris Squire when I was 17 years old. I was one of those kids that followed him after the show. My best friend and I followed their limousine back to the hotel in Portland. Um, and when he got out of the car, I went up and started talking to him. And he was so kind to me. And at 17, I was the most hyperactive kid you'd ever want to name. <laughs> Mr. Squire. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> but he was really cool. And he answered my questions. And he didn't ever give me the feeling like he wanted me to stop or be done. He was like just very patient. I kind of think he smoked a big joint is what I said. <laughs> but anyways, he was very, very patient. And he was like that and until, and I said, well, thank you very much. And he goes, you're very welcome anytime. And he turns around and walks. That left such an impression on me that to this day, I will never be an asshole to anybody because, I mean, that meant everything. Had he been an asshole, what, what would my reaction have been? How would I have changed my outlook on things in, as, in the years coming? So, um, so yeah, I'm very committed to being cool to anybody that wants to do this because my God, you deserve it. Wow. That's really inspiring. That's really yeah. neat to hear. Yeah. And I think you have that reputation of being a nice, I've never heard anybody say anything bad about you. Oh, well, maybe that's why. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> yeah. well, there we go. That's, that's good. I'll have to, um, who I've seen be a complete jerk and smart ass since, but. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> but, but no, but it, it's because he's got a great sense of humor. Chris Squire is one funny, was one funny dude. May he rest. Wow. Yeah. That, no, I hear it's interesting when I started this podcast and I, I've done over 300 and it's a lot of musicians and most of them are, yeah, very kind, very down to earth. I mean, I don't see them obviously on tour and behind the scenes and stuff, but at least they're able to fake it with. <laughs> with uh you know interviews and, and stuff and more and more that's getting to be the case you know there a lot of the 80s bands you know of the dock and genre when, when i kind of took ourselves way too seriously and there was a lot of that then that i think fortunately has kind of backed off people don't take it quite as seriously i mean there's still a few people from that era that i see taking things a little too seriously still but overall um people have mellowed out a lot they've kind of seen things in perspective and I think a lot of us are just really grateful that we're still playing music. 
And that, that's how I feel. I just, I'm very grateful that that's what I get to do. That's interesting. You say taking too seriously. I feel like that era was, was more about fun and just not ha- taking too seriously. I mean, I don't know, maybe the early eighties was a little different than the later eighties. No, I mean, but what I mean by taking too seriously is the whole fame and fortune thing. You know, that's where a lot of the people in that area, sure, the songs were about fun and party and everything, but there was this underlying sense that they, we were all big rock stars, you know, that, that was that was a real goal. Um, and I find that to be very empty and vacuous. So, um, and I think most people have since then. And yeah, the songs were about fun, but there was a lot of ego involved. And I think a lot of that is mellowed out and that's good. Okay. Yeah, no, that is good to hear. Yeah. Cause I mean, you look at guys like Alice Cooper and it's just like, well, I mean, he just doesn't have any of that. He's been cool for a very, very long time. He's been sober a very long time too. And Alice is just a wonderful, wonderful guy. And just, yeah, he is not an example of somebody in the eighties that took themselves too seriously. Yeah. Well, what about um, the image? Cause that was such a big thing back in the eighties MTV. Uh, but it seems like the look is not as important now. Like, I mean, if you look at people like, uh, you know, Lizzo who have massive success, I mean, a person like Lizzo would not have, they wouldn't have let her be in the music business in the eighties. Right. Um, do you think that that is a, is changed dramatically? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when MTV came out, it was all, you know, glitz and glamor. Of course it's going to happen. It's television, you know? Um, and, you know, there was music had its flirtation with that, but I, you know, I think it gets old like anything. Um, and I think people, people have become very specialized in their music too. You know, it's like they, they, hmm. they find their little niches. Maybe it's their own niche of a playlist that can be combined from different genres, but, but people are getting very, very singular in their focus now. Um, so I think that makes it in some ways more about the music, which is good. Um, but unfortunately, the mainstream media music the mainstream music infrastructure, shall we say, just doesn't seem to be set up for nurturing new artists yet on the level it needs to be to really become mainstream. There's some of that going on, but there needs to be a lot more of it. And I hope there is. And I bet there will be soon. What do you mean? Like, give me an example of how you would nurture a younger artist. Well, Because first of all, to get signed to a label, you sort of have to sound like something or, you know, there's not really a criteria for signing something completely original. They won't take that kind of a chance. So that has to change. You know, think about, you know, think about who signed, uh, well, Yes, for instance, you know, when when Yes got signed, you know, they went through a couple of records, nobody bought anything. It was crazy and then they started getting crazier with their music but a label got behind it and supported and I, I know a lot about that because phil carson our manager was the guy at atlantic records that made yes happen and that was like i say they were taking a musical chance people don't do that today they need we, we need music people music visionaries again to sign artists that are really creative and new give them a chance and then give them the infrastructure of a major label for tour support, album distribution and marketing. And that's what needs to happen. And I think somewhere along the line, somebody's going to get the idea, but more than likely it'll happen because somebody's going to come out of the internet with something very new and creative. It's going to catch on and then the labels will chase it. And that's the problem. They're chasing rather than creating. If they can get, if they can get into a zone where, hey, look, that worked, let's start, let's start us being creative and let's start us looking for fresh, new, interesting talent. Maybe that can happen. And if that does happen, I think there's a much better shot for mainstream uh, for mainstream music opening up into a much more creative field. Yeah, because I, no, I mean, you bring up an interesting point how the labels are chasing because you're right. Like, I think in some ways you don't need a label. If you're really popular, you can, anybody yeah. can upload to YouTube and Spotify. And if st- something's really good, it's going to blow up. But you're saying that having that support would help bring more eyes on some things that are maybe a little bit different that could blow up later. Right, right. Because you're still not hearing any rock songs on top 40 radio. You know, you don't hear that at all anymore. And you used to. You used to hear a lot of rock on mainstream radio. So... Uh, I would love to see that change. Um, but again, it's it's all about the the music, the infrastructure of major labels, and and they're a long ways off right now. 
Yeah, no, I agree. It is weird how, uh, that's what I liked about the eighties and nineties was especially like 91, right? Right. Was when grunge was starting to get popular, but you know, hair metal was still cool. There was a mix and I love that. That was a great year yeah. of rock. You had yeah. like Metallica and Guns N' Roses and Nirvana all having yeah. huge albums. Yeah, that was that was a great period. You're you're absolutely right. And of course, the next year, 92, is when hair metal just died. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Died. <laughs> like, I they, still think but it sucks because I a lot of those albums that came out then. In fact, I loved the Doc and Dysfunctional album. I might be the only one. But they played that song Too High to Fly in Seattle on Seattle Rock Radio in 95, which is kind of crazy. But I heard that song and I was like, I got to get this album. The song is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. That was that was the objective. And and it did kind of work. Yeah, that was that was great. Well, I mean, listen, quality will last the test of time. Um, and I think a lot of what Dokken did there was a lot of quality and a lot of it. So it will stand the test of time. There was some pretty disposable music that came out of the hair metal scene, but you know, the great stuff has survived. You know, there's still some great rat stuff, some great warrant stuff, some great slaughter stuff. You know, there's, there's still plenty of good stuff out there. Do you think the next phase of rock maybe incorporates an electronic component or something? Cause I always thought like nine inch nails, I thought that was going to be the future, more the electronic mixed yeah. with rock, but it hasn't really taken off like that. Yeah, I mean, there's elements of it. I mean, you know, even in a band like Evanescence, you kind of hear a little bit, but but you're right, more 15 years ago than what you hear now. So, yeah, I was a little surprised at that too, because I thought uh, the Downward Spiral was a huge record. I mean, that 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 really made a difference in my mind. I was a huge fan of that record, so I could I I, I kind of thought like you did. Um, I don't know, maybe, but I think what people are starting to crave more and more is more organic things so um i see the next wave i kind of hope as being a more raw and organic phase kind of the opposite of this perfect pro tools phase that we're in so i hope so and maybe that's you know maybe if somebody comes up with just a raunchy you know new rolling stones guns and roses kind of vibe that's loose and cool um and not perfect maybe that would have a chance I would love that. That's what I always think of. In fact, I've actually thought of just managing, starting a band, like not playing, but just picking out musicians and getting my own Guns N' Roses, like a modern day version. I think yeah, that yeah. somebody should do that. <laughs> yeah. I, I And I'd love to produce it. <laughs> yeah. Would you, is that something that you'd be interested in doing after yeah. Foreigners, maybe kind of mentoring younger bands and producing and helping out? It's starting this minute. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I'd love to do that. I would love to find a band that has, a real vision. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Very cool. Well, you're in, involved in so many projects right now. Foreigner is going to be on the road. Uh, the revolution saints record is out tomorrow. We said Friday. Yes. 421. Um, and then, uh, is there, I think, is there, you just had a new record with uh, black Swan, but, and is there going to be another end machine? I think heard you say yeah. something about a new we're singer with that. Working on it. We're working on an end machine record right now. It's almost all written and mostly tracked. Um, it's got some tracking to go, but, uh, yeah, the M Machine record, I believe, is going to come out um, early 24, I think. I think that's what they want to do, is what I've heard. But but that record's done. I'm going to start writing another Black Swan, which is Reb Beach, Robin McCauley, and Matt Starr. I'm so going to start writing that um, at the end of this year. Um, but that, too, probably won't come out till 25. So, yeah. Okay, you're going to be busy. So, yeah, got a re there's a another Revolution Saints record in the right. can already. That'll come out next year. Uh, and then this summer, we're going to start writing um, another Revolution Saints record. And I've already got a couple songs for that. So, um, yeah, I got, I got my projects mapped out. <laughs> yeah, a lot of projects. Is there anything, um, is there any projects that you were close to being a part of or like you tried out for that you didn't get that were like would have been huge? Um, hmm, good question. Not that I can think of offhand. Okay. Well, there's always this future. I mean, if somebody, if after Foreigner ends, if, if some other big giant band comes calling, would you join another big band like that? Or do you think you want to just kind of lay low and more, do more producing? I would have to see, cause I, I, I do want to be at home more. <laughs> so I don't, you know, joining another band, I, that's kind of not on my mind at the moment, but we'll see. You never know. 
Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Well, I'll let you get going. I always end promoting a charity or a nonprofit or a cause. Do you have something like that that's near and dear to your heart? Um, well, I will say if um, if people are into meditation, I'm doing a virtual meditation class. It's generally Monday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Sometimes it has to change because of my touring schedule. But um, if you go to yoga at hotforyogascv.com, you can get the information to how to how to do plenty of virtual classes, not just my meditation. There's other stuff you can get too. And if you get a, a monthly virtual pass, you can get all those classes. So it's it's a pretty cool deal. Um, but if you want to join our meditation class, it's great. And it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, way to really calm down. Oh, I agree. I, I did a transcendental meditation. I've tried other progressive muscle relaxation. I feel like that's something that should be taught in schools. I used to work in schools. I'm like, why do we not teach meditation? I, I mean, it, it's non-religious or whatever. It's, it's anybody can do it, whether you're religious or not religious. Like it's not a spiritual thing in that regard. So I don't know. It, and it, there's scientific evidence that shows that it calms your body down. Oh, there's a lot. Yeah. And, and like I say, I credit that for me being able to survive the crazy music business that I've been able to survive. So yeah, it's a great thing, but, but you ask for uh, something I'd like to plug. I, I love getting people to that. So that'd be great. Okay. I'll put that in the show notes along with, wait, do you have a, do you have your own, is there like a Jeff Pilsen website or? Uh, there is uh yeah, there is a Jeff Pilsen.com. Um, I'll put that in the show notes too. And that's, uh, I mean, where people go on your Wikipedia and just see the massive list of all the music you've made. It's awesome. Very cool. And come and visit my Jeff Pilsen fan page. On Facebook. Okay. On Facebook, yeah. And you're on I think you're on Instagram and Twitter too. I think I follow you on them. Sure, yep. sure, sure. The real Jeff Pilson on Instagram. So. All right. Thanks so much, Jeff. Appreciate hey, it. Too. Great interview, man. I appreciate it. All right, have a good one. You too. Bye bye. Well, there you go, Jeff Pilson. Uh, you heard him shout out his social media. So make sure to follow him on there, like, comment, share his stuff. And of course you can do the same with the shows, uh, the show's social media and YouTube. It definitely helps myself and the guest out. And make sure to check out Jeff's latest project, Revolution Saints. The third album should be out soon, and the fourth one is coming. So I appreciate all your support for the show and the guests. As always, have a great day and shoot for the moon.